Well, we're going to leave our offering to the end because we're talking, we're on our fourth actual uh, teaching on generosity. So we do a series once a year. We don't talk about money. We don't preach about money a lot here, but we do want to do a series once a year. This is our fourth session. We're teaching on tithing today. And I got Tom Wilson. You want to come up, Tom? Some of you, I don't know if you all know Tom Wilson, but he's been coming to the church for about a year now. And uh, he works crazy, crazy shifts, but he's here. And when he's here, we love to have him, brother. God bless you. And we're excited to hear the word of the Lord. Why don't we give Tom a hand? Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it's good to be here with my brothers and sisters in the Lord this morning. God bless you all. And uh, I am going to be speaking about tithing this morning. But I bring good tidings of great joy. This is the last session on tithing, I believe. Please hold your hallelujahs to the end. I know you're excited to hear about tithing once more. I'm sure there will even be a little bit of overlap because we didn't coordinate this too much. But uh, I hope it works out. We'll just trust the Holy Spirit for that. I appreciate what Allison uh, shared this morning. And actually what the scripture says about that, when Jesus was in his hometown and he could only heal a few sick, the, the scripture actually tells us that he was amazed at their lack of faith. Let me tell you something. You don't want to amaze God with your lack of faith. You don't want God to look at you and say, I'm amazed at the lack of faith you have. That's never a good thing. It's a pretty amazing scripture, really. So this morning, I do want to talk about tithing. Tithing is um, something that's uh, very near and dear to my heart. It has been since I was a small boy. Um, my testimony is a lot like Timothy. I came to know the Lord through my grandmother and my mother because my, my father's not saved and uh, hates church very much. Um, and hates uh, this Christian walk that we live. Um, so, but for me, I mean, I've spent my money on a lot of things in life. I don't know about you guys, but I've had a lot of regrets and a lot of the things I've spent, a lot of buyer's remorse. But I've never regretted uh, tithing or the offerings I've given. When I, I pay that, it's the most exciting thing I do with my money. Uh, it, it, it's been, I felt that way my entire life because it's one of those investments that I just know is I'm, I'm storing up treasures in heaven uh, where no moth can eat at it. I know it's an investment that will return to me in, in, uh, in, in all sorts of different ways. And it's, it's just one of those things that uh, I've never felt bad about. It's, it's the one thing I do with my money that I'm sure of. Everything else I do, not so sure. But uh, it's one thing that I do that, that uh, has, always, has always blessed me greatly. So in 1998... I apologize, it's a bit of an old study now, but a study was done which showed that Christians around the world gave an average of 1.8% of their income. Yet in the Bible, instruction regarding tithing is given approximately 40 times in the Old and New Testament. Did you get the PowerPoint email I sent you? It's on there? Oh, perfect, okay. Yeah, that's probably the first one. Okay, great. I was hoping you got that. Um, so 40 times in the New and Old Testament, approximately tithing is talked about. And that's not, to, that, that, that's not even to mention all the times that um, the law of first things and the law of reaping and sowing are talked about. That's over and above that. Jesus himself in Matthew 23, 23 and Luke uh, 11, 42, I believe it is, um, said uh, that when he, he, was re he was referring to, um, he was criticizing the Pharisees and he was referring to um, practicing justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And he said, you should have practiced those things and not neglected the tithe. Um, so Jesus himself in, in specifically endorses tithing in, in the New Testament. And yet, it begs the question, why is there so much debate among us and resistance to, towards tithing amongst us? So let's ask some questions this morning about tithing. What is tithing all about, anyway? Where did it come from? Why would God ask us for a portion of our money? when it is so critical to our well-being and to, to ourselves and to our families. The first thing we have to understand about tithing is it's not about money at all. And if you're here this morning for the first time and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, uh, I, I want to make it very clear. If you don't remember anything else, I want you to know that God's not after your money, but he is after you. And he has a purpose in tithing towards that goal, towards the goal of, of having you. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. So yeah, so God, God is not after your money. And I'm certainly not because I don't even work here. So I, I don't know if you do tithe or if you don't or if you will tithe after this. I'll have no idea. But I do care about you. And you might say, well, we're, we've never even met. Why would I care about you? I care about you because I care very much about the Lord. And I know how much he cares about every single one of you, each one of you here this morning, how desperately he wants you. 
and the lengths he's went to to accomplish a relationship with you, an open heaven where you can have open relationship with him with no blocks in between. And tithing is a very important part of that. And we're going to look at that this morning. Tithing has never been about money. It's never been about grain being stored in a silo. It's never been about fruit. It's never been about animals or animals being destroyed for him. What tithing is all about and what these things, law for sin is all about, we'll look at that in a moment. It's about putting God first and that God must be first in our lives. The law of first things is referred to over and over in both the Old and New Testament. And a few example, uh, examples of it are seen in the Ten Commandments, in the sacrifice of the firstborn animals to the Lord, and in Matthew 6.33, which says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. So what the Old Testament does in a lot of cases, and certainly in the law of first things, is it establishes these things, animals and fruits and grains and things that don't really make sense at the time. And in the New Testament, Jesus and Paul, to a great degree as well, then illuminate these things and explain that, sort of give the secrets away, and they explain that it's really about relationship. And we'll look at, we'll look at that as well. So seek ye first the kingdom of God and, and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. That's the law of first things, being fulfilled, being revealed. So why does God have to be put first for the release of power in your lives to occur? So what we know from the law of first things, what Jesus is telling us here, is that if you put your spouse or your children or your job before the Lord, and then somewhere down the mix you obey his word and, and you come to church, that doesn't release the power of God in your life. That doesn't, all these things won't be added unto you, the Bible says, unless you put God first. It's very important to understand that. God has to be put first in your life for power to be released. God is a jealous God. He's jealous for you. It's you he wants. Your love, your attention, your time. It's you he's after. It's you he loves. He wants to be Lord of all or not Lord at all. He wants to, you to be hot or cold, but not lukewarm. That's what the law of first things is all about. Now, another very important principle for us to understand is the law of reaping and sowing, because it comes into play here, too. It's a different type of law in the sense that reaping and sowing is a universal command, and it's universally recognized in the world. Some people call it karma. Some people say what goes around comes around, but it's universally recognized. And the universal laws are simply laws. The, the physics are a good example of them. They're simply laws that exist whether you believe in them or not. It doesn't matter if you believe in gravity. If you step off a cliff, you will fall. <laughs> and that's and that's and, and the Lord has built our world, our universe, on universal laws, such as gravity, such as reaping and sowing. So we see that Second Corinthians nine six, Paul says, "Remember this: whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously." We see it again, a, a great one in Hosea eight seven. They sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind. So we see here that it, it doesn't matter what you believe, whether you're a Christian or not, if you sow evil, you'll reap evil. If you sow good, you'll reap good. You make a good investment, you'll get good returns. It's just, that's, that's just the natural order of things. So God desires to know that you, that you love him. He wants to know that he is first in your life. That's what tithing is really all about. So let's look at the law of first things a little more closely. So if you can put that slide up for me. Let's look at uh, Exodus 34, 19, 20, and 26. All right. Let's read it together. The first offspring of every womb belongs to me, including all the firstborn males of your livestock, whether from herd or flock. Redeem the firstborn donkey with a lamb, but if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem all your firstborn sons. No one has appeared before me empty-handed. Bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. Okay, let's break that down. So this is God speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, and he gives him some instructions about how he wants his relationship with the Israelites to work. Okay, so what belongs to God? Let's break that down real quick. What belongs to God? Every firstborn son does. Every firstborn male animal, whether clean or unclean. All the first fruits of the land. 
what are the clean and unclean animals? The clean animals were oxen, goat, sheep, pigeons, and turtle doves. An example of an unclean animal was a donkey. Later, God gives the Israelites further instructions about these things that belong to him. Can you put the next slide up for me, guys? You did a heck of a job back there, by the way. I appreciate you. Okay. Levit this is Leviticus 27, guys. 26, 28, 30. No one, however, may dedicate the firstborn of an animal. Since the firstborn already belongs to the Lord, whether an ox or a sheep, it is the Lord's. If it is one of the unclean animals, it may be bought back at its set value, adding a fifth of the value to it. And if it is not redeemed, it is to be sold at its set value. But nothing that a person owns and devotes to the Lord, whether a human being or an animal or family land, may be sold or redeemed. Everything so devoted is most holy to the Lord. I want you to remember that where it says here, holy to the Lord. Whenever you see in the scriptures where God says, this is holy to me or most holy to me, or if he says, this is um, um, ho holy to me anyway, sacred, sorry. Wherever you see where it says, where the Lord says, this is sacred to me or this is holy to me, that's him telling us to pay extra close attention to this thing. And we're going to look at an example that I'm going to end with today where someone, God said, this thing, this silver and gold is sacred to me, and someone doesn't listen to the Lord. And we're going to look at the example of that the Lord gives us. But whenever you see that, holy to the Lord or sacred to the Lord, that's him trying to get our attention. So everything so devoted is most holy to the Lord. A tithe, of, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. I want you to remember that. So the sum of all this is that every firstborn clean animal was considered by God to be a devoted offering, which meant that it could only be used for one type of sacrifice, and that was to be burned up and totally destroyed. If you had a firstborn clean animal, it had to die. It was devoted to die. There was no way around this command. You could not use a firstborn clean animal for a different type of offering, such as a sin offering, because it did not belong to you to use. It belonged to the Lord. Also, you could not redeem a firstborn clean animal for another firstborn clean animal. They both had to die. Wow. Now, in regards to the unclean animals, Every firstborn unclean animal also belonged to the Lord, but they were not acceptable sacrifice to the Lord because they were unclean. So they had to be made acceptable. Oh, that helps. Now, there are three ways to do this to make an uh, uh, unacceptable, an unclean animal acceptable sacrifice. One way was to buy the unclean animal back by paying a fifth more than it was actually worth. And by doing that, you could spare the unclean animal's life. The second option was this. You could redeem the unclean animal by substituting it for a lamb. The clean animal would then die for the unclean animal. Wait a minute here. Does that, does that sound familiar at all to you? I'm starting to think that maybe, God, there's more going on to this, this law for things than, than just animals and fruit. Because so I want to tell you guys something. Proverbs 25, 2 says this. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, to search out a matter is the glory of kings. If you're sitting here this morning and you are born again, you are a king and a priest unto the Lamb of God. And as a king, it is to your glory to search out the secret things of God in his word and discover them. The word is full of secrets, and so is the universe, and it's your glory as kings to seek them out. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 9. I think I have a slide for this one, actually, guys. Okay, Paul says this, 9, 9, 1 Corinthians, Corinthians. For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox as it treads through the grain. Do not muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Paul says, surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us, because whoever plows and threshes should be able to do so in the hopes of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? Okay, Paul does a couple of important things here. One is, that kind of relates to our word today, is that 
he's saying that anyone that's in the ministry full time that devotes himself, that we, as members of the church, members of the congregation, have a spiritual obligation to support them financially. That's what Paul's telling us here. That that's one of our duties to the Lord, is that anyone that devotes himself full time to the ministry, that we have an obligation. That's what God expects of us, to take care of them financially. What I like even more importantly, I shouldn't say more importantly, but just as importantly, is he's telling us a big part of the secret here. He says, you know, when God was talking about oxen there, not much, do, you, do you think that was about animals that God was talking about? Do you really think that, that that was about animals? He's saying, Paul's saying, that wasn't about animals at all. He said he's talking about people there. To search out a matter is the glory of kings. The law of first things is not about animals at all, guys. It's about God and our relationship with him. Of course, Jesus was the clean animal that died for me, the unclean animal. He spared my life he, to redeem me. That's why when John the Baptist saw Jesus walking towards him, filled with the Holy Spirit, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. God in the flesh laid down his life for you and I, but he didn't have to. This is important because the third option of what the Israelites could do with a firstborn unclean animal was that if, not, if they did not wish to redeem it or if they felt the cost of them was too great to redeem it, then they had to break its neck because according to the law, it had to either be killed or redeemed. What that means is that God would have been well within his rights to say that the cost to me is too great to redeem these people. I'll just break their necks and be done with it. He could have thrown us away with from him forever, along with Satan and all the fallen angels, who also disobeyed. But he, instead, he said, the cost to me is great, but I choose to pay it. Do you know how greatly God loves you this morning? Do you realize how valuable you are to your Father? Do you recognize how important your relationship to God is to him? What a cost he paid to make that relationship possible. But we must ask ourselves again, what does this have to do with tithing? So none of this has to do with animals at all. In fact, God doesn't like lambs more than he likes donkeys. It's just that donkeys represent stiff-neckedness, rebellion, traditionally. And what he's, he's telling us things there. He's telling us that if, if we're stiff-necked, we're unclean, the unclean animals, like a donkey, we have to break that in ourselves. We have to break that stiff-neckedness, that rebellion, and submit ourselves to him for any of this to work. And he's doing many other things there, but that's all we'll talk about this morning. Okay, so God gave Moses these various laws containing checks and balances so that God's people would have ways to prove to him that he is first in their lives. And yes, God tests us. We're going to look, that, that, that's going to become abundantly clear in a moment. The scriptures are very clear on that. But all these tests, trials, and tribulations of this life, I'm convinced that this entire life is a test. And some of us get very short time, some of us get a longer time. Those that have a shorter time, not as much as expected, but the scriptures say that to whom much is given, much is expected. And for those of us that are here longer, much more is expected. And we're tested greater to, um, on many levels, on, for many different things. And we have to pass these tests. So God said, there are certain things that belong to me. And he has his reasons for that. God says here that if you hold them back from me, or try, in, back in Leviticus, if you hold them back from me or try to offer them in some other way than the way I've set out for you, then you're disobeying me, robbing me of what's mine. That's why it's wrong to use part of your tithe for some other type of offering. The tithe doesn't belong to us. It belongs to the Lord. It's most holy to him. Remember? Remember Leviticus 27.30. A tithe of everything from the land belongs to the Lord. It's holy to him. So you can't pay a tithe. You can only return it to the Lord because it belongs to him. And if it does not belong to us, then to keep it or to offer it in some other way is robbing the Lord of what is his. See, an offering, an offering by its very definition is giving the Lord something that, that is yours to give, that belongs to you. That comes after the tithe because that's not yours to give. That's yours to be returned. So he doesn't need your money, but there is something that God does need. And there is something he desires above all else. And you see it every time you look in the mirror. He 
He's after you. He's after your heart. He wants to know that he's first in your life. He also wants you to know that he is first in your life. C.S. Lewis once said this, I don't know if God intends my prayers to change him so much as they are to change me. God desires to be your first love and to be first in your life. Our obedience to God and his word is the only way we have. Our obedience to God and his word is the only way we have of proving that to him, of showing him that he's first in our life. And obedience to him and his word, putting him first, is the only thing that releases the power and the abundance of God in our life. John 14, 21, Jesus said this, Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one that loves me. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one that loves me. When God told Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac on a, uh, as a burnt offering, Abraham must have wondered. After all, Isaac was the child of promise, and if he died, how could Abraham have what God promised him? Yet Abraham, in obedience to God, does not hesitate, but takes Isaac up Mount Moriah. He builds an altar, uh, binds Isaac to it, and he picks up the knife to kill his son. Which I think I have a slide for this, guys. Yes, I do. Praise God. Genesis 22, verse 12 says this. This is God speaking. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. That's an amazing scripture to me. God says, now I know. Hold on, doesn't God know everything? Yeah, he does. So why didn't he just say in his mind, you know what, let me just check myself for a minute here. Does, am I first in Abraham's life? Let me just play out a scenario. If I tell him to go kill his son, oh my gosh, he'll do it. I can foresee that. So I'm not even going to ask him to because I already know. And yet he makes Abraham walk through it. He makes him do it. He, he makes him raise the knife. Why? Uh, maybe it's like C.S. Lewis said. I don't know if sometimes God does these things to change him or to change me. That I can't really answer for you. I don't know. Who knows the mind of God? But he makes us walk through these things. He tells us to do them and then looks to see if we do. Because he's accomplishing something between us and him by doing these things. Amazing thing. God says to Abraham, now I know that you fear me. In other words, now I know that I'm first in your life. And because of your obedience, now I will bless you. Sometimes we think to ourselves, I can never have passed that test. I can never have been faithful like Abraham was. But when you return the tithe to the Lord, not knowing if the remainder of your money will be enough to pay your bills, to feed your children, you are stepping out in faith, just like Abraham. You are putting you and your family's well-being on the line in obedience to the Lord. And only after obedience does the blessing come. I've had many people, some of them very close to me, say to me over the years that they can't afford to tithe. And I understand. I know what God is asking you to put on the line, your well-being, your family's well-being. But guys, and I've seen a lot of people go through this, I, and I can speak from my own experience. You can't afford not to tithe. That's the honest truth. You know, one of my favorite scriptures is Proverbs. It says this, that a friend's wounds can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. And what that scripture is telling us, what God's telling us there is he's saying that a friend, if you really love someone or if someone really loves you, they'll tell you the truth even when it hurts. But an enemy will just tell you what you want to hear, lead you down the garden path to destruction. You can't afford not to tithe. I want us to ask ourselves this morning, what is your reality? What do you believe? Is your reality that at the end of the month that you have $5.02 left and you're in real trouble? Or is your reality that at the end of the month you've got $5.02 left, but that's okay because your God is the same God that took five loaves of bread and two fish and with it fed 5,000 men plus their wives plus their children until they all ate and couldn't eat anymore. Is that the God that you serve? Or is that just a story from a long time ago and he doesn't do things like that anymore? Only you can answer that. What do you believe? 1 Thessalonians 2.4 says this, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people 
but God who tests our hearts. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. No tithing word would be complete without Malachi. I apologize up front. I think I have a slide for that, guys. I think I have a slide for that one more. There it is. 3, 6, 10. Okay. That doesn't have everything I want. Everything I want. Is that all I put down for you guys? Is it on the next one? Oh, okay. Yes, it is. Malachi 3, 6, 10 says this, I, the Lord, do not change, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? God says, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Another side note to this really neat scripture because of course, the scripture is very clear. Thou shalt not test the Lord your God. Jesus quotes that, actually, when Satan is tempting him when he leads him into the desert. And yet God says here, in this one exception, you can test me in this. He said, test me in this and see what I do. He also makes it very clear, if there's any doubt here, that when we don't return the tithe to him, that we are robbing him. Uh, which, of course, he told us also in Leviticus. So tithing's never been about money. It's not about grain, storing up grain in a silo. Again, remember Paul, is it about oxen that God's talking about here? It's not about grain in a silo. It's not about money. It's not about any of that at all. The Lord says, return to me, and I will return to you. God is desperate, desperate to be first in your life above all. But can we tithe in the wrong way and not be blessed? with how did God say it in Malachi with so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Absolutely we can. And that's fundamental to understand. Because he's not after our money. It's not about just giving 10%. That, that's not what it's about. And so if all you're doing is giving him a tenth of your income, he can't honor that because he's a good father. And that's not what he's after. See, God is a good father. It's just like you as a father. If you're a good father, when, if your child does something wrong, when you've told him to do one thing, he does another, you, don't, you won't reward him for that because then you'll reinforce that what he did was by disobeying was right. So until he gets it, what you're really trying to teach him, he's not going to honor that. He's not going to reward that uh, because then you'll just keep doing it. Okay, so I'm going to show you what I mean by that. So how we can tithe wrong. Um, so for that, I'm going to ask for a volunteer in a minute, brave soul. But this, uh, you know what, I'm going to do it like this. Bear with me for one moment. This is going to be a little tricky for you to see here. So I will try to describe it. Okay. This represents your monthly income. They could be $1,000 bills. They could be $100 bills depending on what your monthly income is, but this is a low-budget operation, so they're $10 bills. <laughs> but they're all identical. So I'm going to place them out here. One, two, in order. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, I'm out of room, so I'm going to go below. But the important thing is, this is number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm going to start there. So what I want someone to do is I want you, if you think you know the answer, I want you to come up and tell me which one belongs to the Lord. And you have to tell me why. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Does anybody think they can do that? Anybody want to try that? Anybody at all? Please, not all at once. <laughs> Slow down, back, please. Okay, you, sir, come on up. What's your name? 
Jack, Tom. Nice to meet you. Okay, bud, which one do you think? Belongs to Lord. Oh, well, you know what? I can't say that's completely wrong. I mean, I can't say that's completely wrong. I, I sing more of the time, but you know what? You're right. There's a great scripture in that God says to the Israelites. He says, you're about to enter the promised land. And he says, well, I don't want you to, and you're going to take it because I, I'm giving it to you. He says, in many years from now, I don't want you to say that it was by the strength of your right arm that you did these things. I want you to remember that it was me. So really, you're right. Like, it's all the Lord's. Absolutely. But it, the tithe literally means 10%. So if you're going to give one of these 10, starting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, which one do you think the Lord wants? These two are pretty. Well, they are. They are, they are pretty. But that's not correct. <laughs> do you want to try again, or do you want me to help you? Well, if this is the first one, then it would be the first fruits. All right, tell me why. First fruits, you said it. Absolutely, right? And you're 100% right. Okay, don't go anywhere. Because you, you're doing really good. I'm going to keep you right here. He's absolutely right. This is the one that God wants. And, and he said one reason why. There's several reasons. But it's, it, it is your first fruits. It's number one. It, more important than that, this is the one that's in God's spot. This is the spot he wants. Remember, he wants to be first in our lives. This is the one that occupies his position. This is where he wants to be in your life. He wants to know that he's first in your life. He wants you to know that he's first in your life. He wants this one. This is the only one he wants. This is identical, which you are absolutely correct to point out to every one of these. It's not even the prettiest one, as you mentioned, which I hadn't even noticed, but I think you're right. That these ones are a little prettier, that side. But they're all identical. There you go. Give him the pretty one. God bless you. Look at that. There's a man after God's own heart right there. Look at that. This is the one God wants because, again, it's in his place. That's why it's wrong, even though this one is identical to it. That's why it's wrong to pay your taxes first. Remember what Jesus said. Give Caesar what is Caesar's, but give God what is God's. Is Caesar here in your life? Or is this God's position in your life? He wants to know. That's why it's wrong to pay your taxes first, your mortgage first, your groceries, and then somewhere down here, okay, I'll give this one to the Lord. See, that's not what he's wanting because he's a good father. He can't honor that. This one's in his position. He wants this one. Um, that's why it's also wrong to spend all this and then tithe on your credit card. And I've seen, you may laugh, but I have people very close to me, so please don't laugh too hard. I have people close to me in my life that, in the past, and they're, they're on the right track now. That's been, actually, it's amazing to see when you, when your heart changes, you get it right. It gets, it's a heart decision. We're going to talk about that in a moment. It, this all has to occur in the heart for there to be power released. But when you get your heart right and understand what this is really about and do it, it's amazing the turnaround and how God starts to open up those windows and bless you. But that said... That said, it's wrong to do that. And I've seen Christians get in big trouble trying to do things like that, trying to compensate, trying to give 10% at the back end through credit cards or borrowing. And that, that's not what God had intended at all. It's supposed to be much simpler than that. It's not supposed to be complicated. I really appreciate you. That was awesome. And this, this, is, this is yours to keep, my friend. The good answer will always have its rewards. <laughs> don't forget, hey, don't forget which one belongs to the Lord, though. Don't give it to me. I don't work here. I don't work here. Okay. Now, actually, it's funny you say that. Because I don't know if that was clear enough, so I'm going to just do that one more time. I need one more volunteer. <laughs> okay. I appreciate that you humor me. In 1 Corinthians 16.2, Paul says this. On the first day of every week, each one of you, that means everyone, should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. Why does Paul say it has to be on the first day of the week? There we go again. God wants to be first, doesn't he? He wants to be our one and only. He wants to be our first love. I'd like to close today with the account of Achan. You can read the account of Achan yourself. 
Uh, I'm just going to summarize it real quick here for the sake of time. But you can find it in Joshua chapter 6 and 7. So I'm going to set up for you. The Israelites have just crossed the jo- uh, into the promised land, and it's time to start taking over. It's God's promise it to them. Jericho is the first city that the Israelites are going to take over. First city of the promised land. And bad news, it's fortified heavily. But the Lord tells Joshua that he's going to fight for them on this first city, this first time. And the Lord's going to hand Jericho over to them. But Joshua tells the army of Israel that they are not to take any of the silver or gold from Jericho because the silver and gold are sacred to the Lord. Now, remember I told you earlier what Leviticus um, 2730, uh, the tithe is holy to the Lord. And I said, whenever, whenever you see uh, the Lord say something is holy to me or sacred to me, that that's him trying to get our attention, that there's something he's trying to say here. So, so Joshua tells the army, don't touch the silver and gold in just this, in this first city because the Lord said he wants it in his treasury. He's called it sacred to him. And he's commanded that it has to go in his treasury. So the Lord just wants them to devote all the silver and gold from this first city. There's that first again, the first city to him. So the priests blow their trumpets, and the army shouts, and we all know the story. The walls of Jericho collapse, and the Israelite army, Israelite army takes this fortified city without any loss themselves. Just a small sidebar. I heard a, a, a man preach many, many years ago. And just take this for what it's worth. I have no idea, but... And I can't remember where he'd heard it, but he said that he, he knew someone or him himself that had an angelic encounter and that this angel had told him that he was there on the day that uh, the walls of Jericho came down. And what he told him was, he said, how it happened was that God had ringed the top of the wall with angels. And when the, they blew their trumpets and shouted that the angels drove the walls straight into the ground, that they didn't just fall over anything else, that they drove them straight down. This thought was interesting take it for what it's worth, but that's, I heard that once. Interesting, anyway. So, anyway, so the, the walls of Jericho collapse, and the Israelites take the fortified city. They walk right in without any loss themselves. But a man named Achan refused to listen. Perhaps he thought he was smarter than everybody else. Perhaps he thought the Lord's request was foolish and a waste of good silver and gold. I don't know why Achan did what he did, but at any rate, he took some of the silver and gold as well as a Babylonian robe, and he hid them in the ground in his tent. And for a moment, he must have thought, I'm rich. No one knows what I've done. It's a perfect crime. Nobody knows. But then the Israelites went on to the second city, which was a very small city named Ai. And the Israelites, after taking this fortified city, Jericho, they go to fight Ai, and the the men of Ai rout them, rout them, make return run, and 36 Israelites are killed. So Joshua, of course, tears his clothes. He goes before the Lord to find out what went wrong, and the Lord says, there's sin in your camp. There are devoted things among you. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove them. So, of course, Joshua has all the people come up before him and says, okay, we got a problem. Nobody confesses. So Joshua, so Joshua says, all right. So he makes him come forward tri- by tribes, tribe by tribe, and Judah was chosen. Still, Achan remained silent. Then the clans of Judah came forward, and the Zerahites were chosen. Still, Achan remained silent. Then the families of Zerahites came forward, and Zimri was chosen. Still, Achan remained silent. Then Joshua made Zimri's family come forward man by man. And Achan was chosen. And Joshua said, son, give God the glory. And then Achan confessed, but of course, far too late. Because of what he'd done, Joshua took Achan, the things he'd stolen, his family, his livestock, and even his tent. And the Israelites stoned them and then burned them. And then just in case that wasn't good enough, heaped rocks over them. Jesus echoed the warning of Achan in Luke 12, 16. I think that's the last slide I have. Yeah, there it is right there. Jesus echoed the warning of Achan when he said this. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, 
You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said, said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Jesus says, this is how it will be for anyone who's rich towards themselves, or sorry, who stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. My brothers and sisters, we cannot afford to have the spirit of Achan. We cannot afford to hold back the things of God from God. Consider this, because of Achan, who was just one man, two million Israelites suffered and 36 men lost their lives. And then on top of that, all of Achan's family suffered. Each one of us has to ask ourselves this morning, is my family suffering because I'm being like Achan? Each one of us has to ask ourselves this morning, is my church family suffering because I'm being like Achan? In 2 Corinthians 9, 6, Paul says this. We read it earlier. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly. So why does Paul say that you should only give what you have decided in your heart to give? Why is Paul bringing our hearts into this now? Why does giving have to be a heart decision? Why does it have to be a matter decided in your heart? It's very important. It's because, like all things in the word, uh, unless the matter is firmly established in your heart, it has no value to the Lord and no value to you. When you get saved, for example, you have to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. And when you make that heart decision, power is released from the kingdom of God into your life. And you are immediately snatched by God out of the jaws of death, eternal death, and you're placed upon the narrow path that leads to life. The eternal life, I should say. You cannot say to the mountain, move, unless you have faith like a mustard seed established in your heart. See, a mustard seed starts out tiny, but becomes a massive tree for the birds of the air to nest in. Tithing and offerings are no different. What God wants regarding tithes and offerings is firmly established throughout the word. Forty some times specifically in the Old and New Testament and many, many more times in side references. But first thing, laws of first things and all these sort of things. But for the power and miracles of the kingdom of God to be released in your life regarding tithes and offerings, it has to be a heart decision. It has to be established in your heart. Because that's what God wants. That's what he's after. If you have not firmly established in your heart what you believe and why you believe it, that mountain just won't move no matter how hard you try or how hard you strive. God doesn't want you to give him anything because you think you have to. He's not interested about that. He doesn't want you to know, or sorry, God wants you to know why you are obeying him. And he wants you to be excited and cheerful about it. God only wants you to do what you've decided in your heart to do. After all, he's never wanted your money, and he doesn't want it now. He just wants you. 